I am privileged to have a community of regular viewers who are smart. My viewers do not tend towards tribalism, partisanship, or emotional outbursts whenever I discuss difficult topics. I am so grateful for that. But I must say that maintaining the health and integrity of my community comes with enormous responsibility. When I put out a video, I want to make sure that the content is not only captivating to the intellect, but also truthful and honest. If I don't, my audience will know it, and that integrity will begin to crumble really fast. This is especially important whenever I discuss subjects relating to mental health. In my time online, I have spoken to people who have been in some really dark places and who were desperate for a reprieve. When I speak to them, I do not wish to offer them false hope via meaningless platitudes or bumper sticker slogans. I want to help them confront that darkness within, all the pain they have suffered and continue to suffer, and help them see that life is still worth living. I want to provide them with rational, logical arguments that favor living. This is because I, too, have struggled with that darkness in my life, and I, too, wanted somebody to give me rational, logical reasons to continue living. Up until this point, I have provided those arguments through analysis of existential fiction. Today, I will engage with what is probably the most difficult piece of existential fiction that I have encountered so far. The first season of True Detective. I have been asked to cover this show for a while, and I understand why. People wanted me to contend with the mind of the pessimist, anti-natalist character named Rust Cole. They wanted me to examine the validity of his arguments, and their basis in the philosophical works of Arthur Schopenhauer and Friedrich Nietzsche. What could I say to a man like Rust, whose daughter tragically died in a car accident? who lost his wife to divorce, and whose job entails the investigation of grisly murders on a daily basis. How could I make an argument in favor of life to a man who believes that human consciousness was a mistake of nature, that it would be in mankind's best interest to collectively commit suicide, to, in his words, opt out of a raw deal? It's not like Rust isn't an intelligent man that he hasn't thought long and hard about his philosophy towards life. I've met people like him who calmly and rationally argue in favor of this worldview. That said, I think there are arguments against Rust's pessimism that need to, at least, be considered. Though Rust's conception of time as a flat circle comes from Nietzsche and is presented in a tragic way, Nietzsche actually wished for people to view it in a positive way. Though Rust's pessimism is rooted in Schopenhauerian philosophy, even Schopenhauer believed in a reality that transcends human consciousness, which is counter to Rust's seeming atheism. This transcendental reality is one that Rust seems to briefly come in contact with near the end of the season, and his experience of it is so powerful that it seems to change his attitude towards life. I hope that by analyzing these varying philosophies and their application to Rust, I can give those who are mired in their own pit of darkness something to think about. You'll do this again. Time is a flat circle. What's that, Nietzsche? Shut the f up. Put it down! I'll address the whole conception of time being a flat circle first, mainly because I have discussed it on my channel in the past and it is what made people recommend True Detective to me in the first place. The concept of time being a flat circle stems from Friedrich Nietzsche and his concept of eternal return, both of which entertain the possibility of life as we know it, repeating again and again forever. Though Rust views eternal return to be scientific fact, Nietzsche did not. Nietzsche merely pondered it. In his book called The Gay Science, he ponders how most people would respond if they learned they would have to repeat their lives for eternity. The trajectory of a person's life up until the point they hear of eternal return would motivate them to either curse their fate or embrace their fate. Rust, of course, curses his fate. Why should I live in history, huh? Fuck, I don't want to know anything anymore. Like I said in the opening of this video, I understand why Rust would respond in such a way. Why would anybody want to suffer through what he suffered again and again? For some people, that pain might be too much for their being to contend with. I take Rust's perspective seriously. 
but I cannot ignore the possibility that Rust overlooked a couple of things. The less important point is that eternal return is not a proven scientific fact, and is actually disputed amongst physicists. Yet, Rust just accepts it as fact, possibly to help justify his pessimism. The more important point is that Rust does not respond to the concept of time being a flat circle in the way that Nietzsche suggested one should. Nietzsche believed that the only way one could viably live in this deterministic universe is to love one's fate, via his ethic of amor fati. Even if one is forced to suffer through undesirable phenomena, Nietzsche believed we should accept this pain so that it may transform us into greater beings. Doing so would help in numerous ways, one of which relates to another one of Nietzsche's most famous maxims, that which doesn't kill me can only make me stronger. If we voluntarily accept the worst tribulations in life, it can lead us down a path that makes many other tribulations lose their potency or relevance. Of course, people will say that there are circumstances, namely medical, which do not strengthen us and only weaken us. Even then, choosing life in those circumstances is a strength that goes beyond the physical. Affirmation of life despite these circumstances is almost universally perceived as heroic, even when it weakens our heroes and heroines. This is why religious symbols like the crucified Jesus are revered by billions, a figure that Nietzsche actually respected, even if he despised the religion that Jesus birthed. I think this is why Rust is so intriguing to so many people, and why so many people hold up the first season of True Detective as the archetype of good television. It's because people are captivated by the enormity of Rust's soul. We can see the suffering he has been through and the toll it has taken on him. He continues to do heroic deeds, and we can't help but respect that, even if they are committed by somebody who would prefer non-existence. To paraphrase Nietzsche, even if pain doesn't make us better, it certainly makes us more profound. In the spirit of being honest with my audience, I will lend an ear to those who reject Amor Fati. One such philosopher was Arthur Schopenhauer, a man for whom Nietzsche had so much respect that he actually wrote a book on why Schopenhauer taught him more than any philosophy professor ever did. Schopenhauer is most famous for popularizing pessimist philosophy in the Western world, making the greatest argument in favor of persistent unhappiness that had been attempted in Western philosophy. Though Nietzsche disagreed with Schopenhauer's perspective on Amor Fati, he nonetheless greatly admired Schopenhauer's honest confrontation of life's suffering, one whose calm, rational tenor mirrors that of Rust. The severity of Schopenhauer's disgust towards life is as evident as it is with Rust. But what is not as evident is how one should respond to this state of affairs. Rust makes it quite clear in the first episode of the show that if his biological programming allowed it, he would commit suicide. He doesn't believe in a god, or any sort of transcendent purpose to this life's suffering. Though he solves crimes and commits heroic deeds, he doesn't see any purpose in it especially because he believes that these crimes will eternally return. This is a stark contrast to Schopenhauer's response to pessimism, which involves the element of purpose. To quote from Nietzsche's book on Schopenhauer, In this way must Schopenhauer's philosophy always be interpreted, as an individualist philosophy, starting from the single man in his own nature to gain an insight into his personal miseries, and needs, and limitations, and find out the remedies that will console them, namely, the sacrifice of the ego, and its submission to the nobler ends, especially those of justice and mercy. Schopenhauer saw values like justice and mercy as transcendent, and that we should sacrifice our sense of self, our ego, in favor of these values. This is in line with the fact that Schopenhauer took an intense interest in Buddhism during his lifetime, viewing it to be a validation of his philosophy. Buddhism posits that life is suffering, and in order to reach nirvana, to reach enlightenment, one must sacrifice the mortal ego, just as Nietzsche said. In a way, this was what Rust was doing, even if he didn't realize it. He, like Schopenhauer, favored justice, and did everything he could to carry it out. But unlike Rust, Schopenhauer believed the transcendent to be more than an illusion. For example, Schopenhauer thought there had to be some truth in a belief as widespread as reincarnation. 
Though he did not believe in the reincarnation of our ego personalities, he did entertain the idea that we would return to the source of all being and reincarnate in a different form. This is not consistent with Rust's perception of time being a flat circle. So once again, it seems that Rust's personal philosophy has some element of picking and choosing perspectives that suit his own brand of pessimism. Which is fine, you know, people do that all the time, but it makes me curious about what his thoughts would be on Nietzsche's and Schopenhauer's true perspectives. My emphasis on the transcendent isn't a confession on my part. I do not belong to any religion, but I do not think it's unreasonable to consider realities and values that transcend our mortal, imperfect existence. Take, for instance, the way True Detective ends. Rust experiences the transcendent when he is tracking down the killer in the dark depths of Carcosa. For some unclear reason, he witnesses a spiral galaxy emerge out of a dark ceiling. Though Rust in the previous seven episodes would pass off such instances as hallucination, this moment had such an impact that it seemed to make Rust go back on some of his atheistic, pessimistic beliefs. This transformation of character was confusing to many people. Some have said that the Rust of the previous seven episodes would pass off moments like these as illusions of the mind, and not evidence of the transcendent. It made some think that this change of heart was artificially added, so the show could have a happy ending. I think this perspective ignores several key elements of the story, namely the references to Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos. Throughout Season 1, we hear about the Yellow King and the aforementioned Carcosa, the Yellow King being the show's main villain and Carcosa being his home. These are references to a book called The King in Yellow by Robert W. Chambers. The Yellow King is a cosmic entity, much like Lovecraft's Cthulhu, one that was adopted into Lovecraft's loosely constructed Cthulhu mythos. Both represent a reality that transcends the human condition, one that cannot be approached without being driven to insanity. One interpretation of True Detective's ending is that the Yellow King was driven to insanity through an experience of something transcendent. Rust also experienced something transcendent avoiding insanity, but was nonetheless subjected to transformation. Why make all these references to Lovecraft's mythology? It was because the writer of True Detective, Nick Pizzolatto, wanted both Rust and his audience to be open to the possibility that there are realities, concepts, and values that transcend our consciousness. One need not be religious or friendly to religion for this to be possible. Just accept what the atheistic Lovecraft said in the opening line of his most famous work, Call of Cthulhu. Quote, The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. Even Rust, who thought he had the world figured out, was left trembling and weeping in the face of something incomprehensible, something that was so powerful that it made him reconsider his perspective. While the transcendent can produce horror, like with the Yellow King, it can also produce moments of awe and beauty. It will enlighten us, give us strength to last a lifetime. These moments don't have to be cosmic or supernatural. They can be purely secular. I have experienced these moments in the darkest hours of my life, when I was in a state of mind that was as bad or worse than Rust's, and I am so glad that I saw them through to the end. Why? Because I realized just as Rust did at the end, you cannot have darkness without light to define it. Better yet, I agreed with Rust when he said the following. Once there is only dark, when you ask any lights went out. 